<clears throat> All right, so we're going to discuss sensory physiology. This is, um, I think, a pretty cool section that helps you to understand how does your taste buds work? How do you hear? How do you feel and touch? At least you get the general idea of it. How do you see? This you'll find correlates pretty well to what you've learned about how nerves work. And so to me, it's really fascinating when you think about how action potentials and the release of neural transmitters and all these kind of things results in the sensations that we feel in our brain, a way of perceiving the environment. And to think about it, how limited our senses are in many regards too. Um, there's lots of different stimuli out there that your body really doesn't pick up on, at least at a conscious level. However, we do have some pretty cool senses. We can, um, you know, we have chemo receptor, receptors that help us to smell or, or to taste. We have mechanical receptors that can pick up on feel and touch. And we have thermo receptors that can pick up on temperature. Photoreceptors um, obviously pick up on photons and light. And so we're gonna get into all of this. So as you know, sensory nerves are key to picking up on sensations and then they're integrated into our brain. And that is where ultimately the sense is detected as far as on a conscious level is concerned. We have sensory cells. These include like pseudo unipolar nerves. We have that example over here on the left where we have an unmyelinated neuron. We have our dendrites up here and then we have our unmyelinated axon and then we have a cell body off to the side. When it's unmyelinated, it tends to be a very short sensory nerve. So really long nerves usually have a myelin sheath around them to speed up a nerve impulse, but really short nerves can get away with a nerve impulse action potential when they're relatively short. We tend to find these short sensory neurons um, located like in our eyes when they are closely associated with photoreceptor cells that we call rods and cones that we'll get to when we get to that section on eyesight. Um, we also have a variety of sensory cells associated with our arms and hands and so forth. And they're either gonna be covered with connective tissue or they're gonna be left naked near the surface. All these kind of things allow us to pick up on fine touch or deep penetrating touch on our skin and so forth. And then we're also gonna have a variety of other specialized cells that help with detecting the environment. So like this one could be a specialized hair cell that picks up on tape, like a taste bud. So that'll look a little different or there might be a specialized cell that picks up on um, hearing or photoreceptor cells. So there's all sorts of specialized cells that are associated with our sensory nerves. In these cases, the sensory nerves you'll notice are coated with a myelin sheath because they probably extend a lot longer distance. Um, synapsing on the central nervous system or to the brain itself. So anyway, these are the kind of examples of sensory nerves. And again, they're going to travel to regions of our brain. A lot of them are gonna be coordinated through the thalamus. Um, and that'll be kind of a relay exchange where I'll go to specialized areas of your brains that we call cortexes, that are areas that are specialized for dealing with that sensory input. For instance, the visual cortex The visual cortex is in the back of the brain. 
Here we have the gustatory cortex, which is obviously going to be related to taste. Here it is in this region. And then we have our primary cortex, which is involved with senses of touch, auditory cortex. You'll notice that the olfactory cortex is really close to the nerves that it associates with in the nose. Um, again, a lot of this is all going through a thalamus. That's where, that is where it's relayed and controlled. So when you think about pain and stuff like that in touch, it's gonna to be in this region. Obviously the front of the brain is more involved with learning and memory and complex behaviors and interactions. Um, here's our auditory cortex, which is going to be involved in hearing. And we have, let's see what else we have. We have our equilibrium here. Let's see where let's follow that up. Obviously, it's closely associated with the, guest, uh, with the primary somatic sensory cortex. So anyway, this ultimately is how you sense and interpret the environment. This gives you kind of an idea of how much of the sensory cortex is devoted to different regions of your body. So if you've been looking at it, this blue strip here, even though it's not blue, it's just painted that for the picture to help you represent, know what nerves are involved. But here it is again, located, where you got that blue strip Here you got that blue strip and you'll see that, for instance, the hands, while relatively small in comparison to the body, utilizes a bigger portion of that part of your brain. And so that's what this, is, this map is showing you, that if your body was mapped to the relative relationship it has with the sensory cortex, the hands would be huge in comparison relative to the body. Like for instance, again, what it's saying that a greater portion of your brain, greater portion of the primary sensory, primary somatic sensory cortex, greater portion of it is for your hands relative to your body. In fact, you can see the back, the sensory cortex and how much of it that, that brain matter is utilized is actually relatively small in comparison in comparison to your real back. That means your brain is interpreting the world of your hands a lot more than your back. A lot more is devoted. In fact, if you were to take two little pins and, and push your finger and, and tap it on your finger or your hand, you'd be able to detect those two touches. While if I did the same two touches on your back pretty close, you might think it is only one touch. So that's an example of how there's a lot more fine information being detected in your hands, for instance, or your lips. You can see down here your face and your lips, a greater amount of brain matter is being utilized for your lips than your back, relatively speaking, because your lips are relatively small, but yet it has an ability to pick up incredible amount of information relative to other portions of your body. Obviously that leads to why kissing and touch of your hands are so important for interpreting the world. Genitalia, while relatively small in comparison to the, your body, still utilizes a huge amount of brain matter. All of this is being relayed through the thalamus. So anyway, uh, the medulla is also involved. The medulla is part of the brain stem and that'll depend on what kind of senses you're picking up and so forth. So looking at the somatic pathways, again, this is gonna be in regards to touch and feel and responses to an integration. Fine touch and proprioception, vibration, all travels as a single, you know, here's a nerve that is in blue, pseudo unipolar, it travels through the brain stem 
and actually synapses with another nerve in the medulla. So it's kind of a relay station there. And from there, I'll travel to the thalamus and then to the portions of the brain that it, it's used in detection. So if it's the limbs, it might be a huge area in comparison to your back, for instance, as I mentioned. Now notice pain reception is a little bit different, actually uses a slightly different nerve network. Instead of being traveling through the spine and then up to the medulla for its first synapse, it actually synapses in the spinal cord. Then when it synapses in the spinal cord, meaning there's a synapse there, so this is the presynaptic neuron, the information then travels up a additional nerve to directly to the thalamus. So it's actually just a straight run through the medulla before it synapses again in the thalamus. Now, why do you think that it may be useful for it to synapse in the spinal cord? Well, the, one of the advantages of synapsing in the spinal cord is that it um, allows for a, another nerve to, to form the reflex arc. So the pain and temperature that are extreme synapse on this nerve, but additional nerves are located here that it can synapse on as well, causing you to move your hand through a reflex arc. If you may recall from looking at the first nerve lecture, you get to, you know, might be reminded of what, how a reflex arc works. So this may be one of the reasons for that. But again, if you look at this key over here, you'll see that the blue is our primary first order neuron. Pain intercepts with a secondary order neuron before going up to the thalamus and being our tertiary or our third order neuron. While Sensations that aren't considered dangerous um, travel to the medulla for integration. But again, it's probably because you're not gonna be pulling your hand away fast or anything like that, at least in part. Now, again, um, we were talking about sensations and how if you were to take two, two little needles and touch your hand, you can really pick up on those two touches. So if you had somebody touch you just like this again on your back, you might actually perceive it as one hand finger touching your back. And so what constitutes some of that in addition to the amount of matter in your brain is this idea of receptive fields and nerves converging onto a secondary neuron. So here's our primary neurons. And you'll see that, you know, this would be a nerve that's with dendrites stretching out over the skin. And you'll see that there's a fair amount of overlap. And so if any of these areas get touched, it travels to the same neuron. And so that secondary neuron then travels to the tertiary that goes to your portion of your brain that says, oh, if it's your back, oh, it's, this one area being touched, even though we know there's two fingers coming in and touching it visually. So the receptive field could be rather large on your back, but that receptive field on your hand is actually gonna be relatively small. So that means they're gonna have more nerves directly interacting, primary nerves directly interacting with a secondary neuron. So your back will have a bigger receptive field while your fingers have a smaller receptor field. And so you'll have more primary neurons directly attached to secondary neurons, while in your back you might have three attached to one. And so that's what is shown here in this example using this metal compass with that have little needle prongs. And if you've ever done a metal compass, you know you can spin it with a pencil and it might draw a circle and stuff like that. Well, in your back, for instance, where you have a large um, receptive field, relatively speaking, your, your back wouldn't be able to perceive that there's two touches occurring. 
because they're all ultimately synapsing onto the same secondary neuron. So there's no fine detection. Well, some area where you have a smaller receptive field like your lips or your hands, you're gonna have primary neurons that are directly synapsing onto secondary neurons, suggesting you know, more direct interaction. Here's another example where we have sensory modality um, and how your body can find control um, its perception. So here we have sensory modality where we see the receptive fields have a role where there's, or if you have more primary neurons intercepting with a secondary neuron, you have less ability to detect that fine difference. While over here you have, you know, primary neurons intercepting directly with secondary neurons. Now there's another phenomenon that kind of correlates with that called lateral modality, lateral inhibition that corresponds with what you might remember from a previous lecture on how a um, neuron can inhibit another neuron and be at the, you know, right in front of the synapse. You may remember that from the previous lecture. Let me see if I can pull that up real quick for you. So as you recall from the previous lecture, nerves can um, synapse on each other and modulate the synapse. So in this case, we have the presynaptic inhibition here where this axon terminal is um, interacting with this axon terminal, and in this particular case, actually inhibits this axon terminal from releasing neurotransmitters like these other ones do because of they lack the presynaptic inhibition. So we see this happening. And so this is the what helps with this lateral inhibition, this presynaptic inhibition. So we'll go back to the sensory notes, but this is from the nerve notes, but I wanted just to help you recall that. I think maybe you didn't see the picture. So let me just put this picture back up. So here's the, from the previous lecture where you have the presynaptic inhibition. You can see how the axon terminal is coming down and it is blocking this axon terminal from releasing neurotransmitters because it's released neurotransmitters that inhibit it. You know, they, when I say inhibit, I mean hyperpolarize it something of that nature so that the calcium doesn't come in and cause exocytosis. So this is what's affecting, oh, excuse me, I can see my cursor. That's what's affecting um, lateral inhibition in the sensory presentation. So what you're seeing here is then that sensory pre, uh, sensory uh, pre, So here we have our presynaptic inhibition. So here we're having our presynaptic inhibition. So here we have a pin touching the skin. And let's suggest that this is probably on your lips or someplace where you have fine control and a smaller receptive area. This is where you're gonna see lateral inhibition most likely. And so when the pin touches, this nerve is fired. And in the receptive area, these nerves are also fired. So it would give your body the sensation that this whole area is being touched initially. That's what you would presume because all of these nerves have fired, they all have depolarized. The pin has caused sodium to come into nerve B. But it's the strongest 
the most, when I say strongest, the most, you know, the frequency of action potentials, because remember it's based on the frequency of action potentials is greatest on the, on the B nerve here. And so these A and C nerves are also stimulated, but the frequency is less. And as a result, B releases more um, neuro sensory neurons, excuse me, releases more neurotransmitters. So B's releasing more neurotransmitters than A or C. Because remember, the frequency of action potentials is greatest coming down B. And so B releases more neurotransmitters than A or C. And so action potentials start to travel down A and C and B secondary neurons from the primary neurons. But remember the graded potential is gonna be the strongest in B secondary neuron. And remember graded potentials go back to the previous lecture. While A and C, it's somewhere in the middle. And so the strength is really strong coming down B. And when it reaches the end of B, the action potentials are also traveling down these other axon terminals. And when they synapse, they actually inhibit A and C. So they're actually inhibiting A and C because the strength is so much stronger coming down. And so when the neurotransmitters are released, they're actually gonna, as you can imagine, neurotransmitters that inhibit depolarization. So they might be causing um, potassium to leave faster or chlorine to go in, or they may inhibit sodium going in. There's all sorts of different neurotransmitters that are involved in this potentially as you saw in the previous lectures. And so when it reaches the tertiary nerve, now remember the tertiary nerve is gonna be going towards the brain into the somatic cortical cortex. And then your body can then more, your, in, your perception is now po uh, focused, you know, like a needle, not to use a pun, but basically it's focused on that specific area that was touched because the other nerves that are gonna to go to those other portions of your brain have been inhibited. And so that's what's happening here. So it allows for you to have more fine detection, particularly in areas like your lips and your hands. This lateral inhibition is turning off the other nerves around it. So as you can see from the stimulus, the primary nerve response is proportionally stronger to the stimulus strength. The pathway closest to the stimulus inhibits the other ones. So they may be trying to inhibit this one as well, but they're not doing a very good job of it because the frequency of action potentials is so much higher. So that this primary nerve or B in this case actually inhibits the other nerves from responding and releasing neurotransmitters. So again, it's because there's greater number of neurotransmitters being released because this pin interacted and stimulated B more than A or C. And then this B neurons, whether it be from the primary, secondary, or tertiary, start to inhibit the secondary neurons. And then ultimately the tertiary neurons aren't firing. It's just B that's really firing. So again, this lateral inhibition increases your body's ability to detect specifically where that stimuli is coming from. So just a quick summary of this area of this information, and then we're gonna go on to the next section. Each receptor is most sensitive to a particular stimulus. If it's a mechanical receptor, it's going to respond to chemical mechanical stimuli. If it's a chemical receptor, it's gonna respond to chemical sensories like the taste buds. There is some overlap, but generally speaking, they're pretty specific. 
<clears throat> a stimulus above threshold initiates action potentials in the sensory neuron that pro projects to the sensory nervous system. So in other words, the peripheral nervous system will send information to the central nervous system or the brain and spinal cord where it is interaction or you know, integrated. The stimulus and intensity and duration are coded in the pattern of the action potentials reaching the central nervous system. So what I, if you remember, greater number of action potentials results in greater amounts of neural transmitters and that is going to basically tell you that stimuli is even stronger in your brain where it's ultimately detected and interpreted. The stimulus location and modality are coded according to each receptor. So you can actually fool your brain sometimes um, by, in the case of sound, sight, and so forth. As you remember, the visual cortex is in the back of your head. And so normally your body's picks up on photons and light, travels to the back of your, of your brain and it's interpreted. But if you get hit really hard in the back of your head, sometimes you see stars. Well, that is an example where different receptors are being modulated because of the physical trauma. Um, you might start to see um, sparks and things like that because those nerves are being activated. Sometimes when you have, um, you know, you put on an ointment on your skin that's like a, a gel, all of a sudden, you know, that methylated gel might make your skin feel cool or feel hot. Well, it's not because the, that those materials are actually cool or hot. It's those, our sensory nerves are picking up on those chemical cues and thinking it's hot or cold. So again, you can kind of fool your body into picking up sensations that are real because of those nerves being interacting with the chemical. So, but, so again, it's a lot of it's based on interpretation and we'll get into more of that a little bit later. But each sensory pathway projects to a region of the cerebral cortex dedicated to a particular receptive field. So that means each part of your brain is responsible for a certain receptive field of touch or other sensation or olfactory cues. And we know that if you open up your skull and you do a surgery and those areas are poked, you'll perceive those sensations and think they're happening. Sometimes people get tumors in their brains and they push on their olfactory bulb and they think they're smelling something that doesn't really exist. So it really starts to make you think about what does it really mean to be a human if it's really just all these different sensations of neurons and action potentials and so forth? Is that what you are ultimately? Like a computer program, you're just zeros and ones. But in this case, it's nerve impulses and not going to certain parts of your brain. It makes you start to wonder what is a soul and what isn't a soul. When you die, is it just a light? You know, is it just a switch? And your nerves fire, and these are all things that I think science does influence people's way of thinking about those kind of things. But anyway, here are the different types of receptors. We have touch receptors, vibration, stretch receptors, hearing receptors, balance. These are all examples of mechanical receptors. So even hearing and balance are mechanical receptors that you'll see in the next lectures where they pick up on movement and fluids and so forth. Sound is actually vibrations moving against ear bones and fluids in your ear bending hair cells. Those are all examples of mechanical receptors. When you're eating too much or you're about to urinate, you have stretch receptors that pick up on when your bladder is filling up with water. It tells your brain that you need to go urinate or stop eating. <clears throat> again, you have thermal receptors that pick up on temperature, but again, they can be fooled with a different chemical and make you think it's something's hot or cold. Or if you put your hand in something really hot for a moment, the first thing is it might feel cold for you for a split second. This is interesting how these receptors interact with your body. 
pain receptors tend to be uncapsulated and directly near the surface of your skin where you can pick up on temperature or something sharp really rapidly. And unencapsulated means that there's nothing surrounding the nerve. It's just free naked neurons. And so when they bend, sodium comes in and causes um, sodium channels to open and action potentials to travel down the nerve. Chemoreceptors tend to be, again, your taste and your smell, but that doesn't mean that other sensations like um, it's, you know, your touch receptors aren't affected. Photoreceptors are also found on your eyes and so forth. Um, these are picking up on photons, but that again, they don't, doesn't mean that this because they're sensitive to light that they can't be fooled by a, you know, like a sharp hit to your head and you see stars and stuff like that. Those are affecting your photoreceptors when you see those kinds of things. So here's the sensory receptors in the skin. You can see that some are um, right near the surface and can pick up on light touch. And again, they would travel up um, to the medulla where it synapses. Just remember going back to that previous slide and how these different nerves interact. Some are going to be surrounding the hair follicle. So you can just touch your hairs and feel movement. Some are going to be surrounded with lots of connective tissue like this Passini corpuscles that help in deep pressure. So it's not, so remember, there's just different sensory nerves throughout your skin. Some are picking up on the hair movement, some are picking up on di uh, deep pressure, some are able to pick up on light touch uh, or thermo temperature. And again, each one of them has a different name and different job. So like these Merkel discs pick up on light touch um, that are found near the epidermis of the skin. Ruffini in, um, endings pick up on pressure. Passini corpuscles, as I mentioned, pick up on deep pressure and high frequency vibrations. So all of them have a slightly different job to do. Here's another picture picking up on how the skin interacts with touch. You can see you have free nerve endings that pick up on noxious stimuli or, or pain. And then again, here's, you can see the Passini, Passinian corpuscles or the Ruffini corpuscles that are all picking up on pressure and touch. Or you have these mesonar corpuscles that pick up on light touch near the skin surface. So anyway, that kind of gives you the gist of how touch occurs um, and temperature. And again, the degree of the touch, the strength of the touch or the, the strength of the temperature is based on how strong the graded potential is and ultimately how many action potentials occur from the generator potential form. So when I talk about graded potentials and generator potentials, we're talking about that's how your body picks up on how strong a stimuli is. We talked about this a little bit in a previous nerve lectures. So something like a light touch that's even, that might, it might, it picks up on a certain, you know, on those Messner um, receptors. And if the light touch is pretty vigorous, the generator potential gets stronger. So light, a really light touch certain sensory cells are gonna pick up on that and the, and the graded potential is gonna be pretty weak for it. Or if you think about the deep pressure ones, they might not even hardly detect it. And so they're gonna have a small generator potential. And if it goes over um, negative 55 millivolts, that's where the threshold is. Going back to that previous lectures, the graded potential or generator potential will then reach the axon hillock or the part of the axon where we have lots of um, sodium channels opening up and then you'll have action potentials traveling down the nerve. So light touch, light sensitivity, light temperature, you're going to have fewer action potentials and ultimately less um, 
neurotransmitters released that go to your brain. And so you'll interpret that as light touch, light temperature, light stimuli, depending on which nerves are being interacting with this, of course. Imagine the temperature gets really high or really cold. Well, you're going to have a much stronger generator potential, resulting in a lot more action potentials, resulting in a lot more neurotransmitters being released. So again, this is how your body picks up on the degree of the stimuli. Is a large part of it has to do with the generator potentials. And again, there's differences in the different types of receptors. Some are more tonic, some are more phasic. Um, meaning that they either can pick up on changes easily or they don't pick up on changes easily. So again, we're just touching the surface on all these different types of receptors. Some are more specialized in picking up on differences and changes and differences in temperature and some um, don't. So let's talk about tonic receptors. Tonic receptors monitor the upper limits of stress that, can, that your body can pick up on. And so it's constantly monitoring um, the response and they're gonna be slow to reacting. Phasic receptors respond to the conditions that change rapidly and they adapt rapidly and then they stop firing. So you, have you ever noticed you're listening to a sound and then eventually you ignore it or the temperature, you get used to it? Well, because initially you saw the phasing receptors noticed the change in temperature rapidly and responded with an action potential and then they stopped responding. And then you got used to the temperature you, you know, it was a little cold and then you got kind of used to it. You went into the swimming pool, it was a bit cold and then you got used to it. Because the phasing receptor picked up on, on the differences in temperature and it was cold. And then it stopped firing and you got habituated to it, got used to it. It, it stopped responding to it. That's what phasic receptors do. But if the water stays ultimately cold and keeps, you know, used to the point where it was unbearable, that is the tonic receptor that's constantly firing, letting you know it's cold, it's cold, it's cold. And you don't really get used to that change much. So anyway, my point is, is there's different types of receptors. Some are better picking up on differences in change and some are detecting the ultimate difference and more about um, how much your, the upper limit of your body can take. So pain and itching, we, we got a little bit into this when we talked about nerve synapsing and so forth. Um, some of it's known as, you know, referred pain and um, some of it is known as, um, Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the control gate, the gate control theory of pain modulation. And so if you remember, when we talked about pain nerves at the very beginning, let's jump back, get it. We talked about how pain <clears throat> intercepts the neurons synapse in the spinal cord, while fine touch goes directly up to the medulla. And so this is gonna have something to do with what we call the um, pain, let's go back to the picture, the gate, the gate control theory of pain modulation. And so let me kind of try to explain that. So here we have our pain related neuron that's, you know, it's linked to receptors or is part of some part of your skin or whatever that picks up on painful stimuli. And as I mentioned, it's synapses in the spinal cord. And in part, this helps for a um, 
<clears throat> a reflex arc where it'll go to an effector and uh, neuron and then ultimately to your muscles so you can move your hand away quickly. Or if you get hit in the elbow or knee, you know, you'll see that reflex arc. Well, if you touch something hot, you reflex. Part of that is the fact that this is synapsing in the spine, but there's also a interesting thing where your pain can be modulated by using touch and non-painful stimuli that normally um, synapses up in your brain. Well, some of the synapses, it can also synapse a little bit in the spinal cord. So while the, most of the fiber goes up into the medulla for the non-painful light touch, some of the axon terminals actually synapse on what we call an inhibitory interneuron. So this is inside the spinal cord. <clears throat> so let me make sure you understand. So in the absence of pain, and which would be the input that would cause an action potential to travel down the slow pain C fiber, that's what they call it, which is tonically actively active, is this inhibitory interneuron. So this inhibitory interneuron is found inside your spinal cord and it's constantly <clears throat> sending a signal that there's no pain happening. So it's releasing neurotransmitters that are causing this ascending neuron to hyperpolarize or to stay negative. So it doesn't hit threshold and have action potentials traveling up to your brain. And then you interact with something hot or you get some kind of pain stimuli that's going down from A to B. With a strong pain, the C fibers stop inhibiting the interneuron or start inhibiting the interneuron. So here we have the painful stimuli coming down, action potentials are traveling down, and then it'll actually will inhibit the inhibitory neuron that is constantly or tonically on all the time. So remember, this is tonically on, this inhibitory interneuron. And again, inhibitory means making the ascending neuron um, hyperpolarized or low threshold. So in other words, when the generator potential is going through, it's less likely to fire an action potential. If you remember all that stuff from the previous lecture, this is like a, a summary um, inhibition occurring here. That's what's happening in this picture. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, go back to the previous lecture or two and you'll see that how, so like, so anyway, <clears throat> this neuron comes along Action potentials are traveling down. Something, something painful has occurred. So there's action potentials and it will send neurotransmitters that will stimulate action potentials in this secondary neuron. Because remember, this is the primary neuron. And it will actually inhibit the, inter, the inhibitory interneuron. So it'll send um, neurotransmitters that actually inhibit it over here on this axon terminal. So this um, little synapse on the interneurons, and so again, the, the inhibitory interneuron is constantly firing, tonically firing. <clears throat> but when a painful stimuli comes along, it'll actually inhibit the inhibitory interneuron, and then that pain stimuli can continue up to your brain. If you hit something hot or touch something painful, um, the pain will go all up to your brain and that inhibitory inner neuron that normally tells your body's fine is actually being blocked. Now, interestingly enough, you can actually modify and kind of start, turn on the inhibitory neuron unknowingly because you're just thinking about when you hurt yourself and then you start rubbing your elbow, let's say you bumped your elbow, and, oh, so you start rubbing it, right? Well, you're stimulating <clears throat> other neurons that respond to positive touch, you know, um, good feeling touch, not painful touch, non-painful stimuli. And when you do that, you trigger those nerves to fire and they all actually come along and sort of turn on the inhibitory interneuron. So here's positive stimuli being sent. And when that positive stimuli gets sent, 
is I'll turn on the inhibitory neuron and then the pain isn't nearly as bad. So that kind of helps explain when you bump your elbow and you're like, ow, oh, and you start rubbing your arm. You're turning on other nerves that, in, that will inhibit the inhibitory, well, will stimulate the inhibitory neuron. I'm starting to get a little tongue tied. So if you get that, what I'm trying to tell you, this non-painful stimuli will travel down these A beta fibers and will actually sort of turn on the inhibitory interneuron. And when it turns on the inhibitory interneuron, the inhibitory interneuron will actually then inhibit the secondary neuron's pain receptor, pain neuron. So it'll actually make it have fewer action potentials and your brain will perceive it as less painful. So just to kind of recap, this inhibitory interneuron is always tonically turned on. And when you're not dealing with pain, this secondary neuron is essentially turned off. You hit some pain and the pain stimulus comes down the C fiber and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, you hurt yourself. And the inhibitory interneuron is actually turned off, making really amplifying the pain that's traveling to your brain. Then you're starting to rub your elbow or whatever to deal with the pain. And by turning on the A alpha beta fibers, it, it partially turns on the interneuron, which partly shuts down the secondary neuron going to the brain by reducing the number of action potentials, by making the generator potential less. And how does it do it? Maybe it prevent, makes potassium leave more, allows chlorine to come in. And this depends on however that neural transmitter is working, which as you recall, different neural transmitters cause different effects on the nerve. So anyway, that's the gate control theory of pain modulation. This is kind of the gate, this interneuron or inhibitory interneuron. Now, what about referred pain? What is that? Well, you've heard of people that get a heart attack and all of a sudden they're clutching their arm or their chest and they're feeling pain and tightness in their chest. Why do they feel pain in their arm if the heart is going under a heart attack? That's what we're talking about when we talk about referred pain. And how does that happen? Well, the idea is that you have nerves that are inter, that are converging onto the same secondary neuron. So whether it be the heart or the kidney, for instance, <clears throat> let's say you've got a heart attack or damage to the heart. Well, the skin in that area also connects to the same secondary interneuron and it travels up to your brain. So your brain interprets it that your skin or arm is under pain even though when you're having a heart attack, it's not your arm that's in trouble, it's your heart that's in trouble. It's because those nerves from the heart and those nerves that from your skin are coming in on the same, or, or synapsing on the same secondary neuron that's found in the spinal cord. And what is your brain does, because you're so used to, your brain knows when you feel something in your arm, it's usually related to your arm. And so it doesn't realize it's actually coming from your heart. Because again, they're sharing the same secondary neuron and you've learned through your life experiences that most of the time, the trust your senses when your arm is touched. So anyway, that's um, what we call to, when we, mean, when we say refer to pain. This explains why if somebody has a heart attack, you know, it's so traditional to think it's your left arm that's in pain, but in reality, it's your heart. And that's because again, they're con those nerves, fibers are converging onto the same secondary nerve. And this is true for other organs as well, like the kidneys. Now let's talk about the sense of smell. And then that'll finish up this set of lectures and then we'll go on to other, um, you know, other, another lecture. But let's talk about the sense of smell. This is due to specialized chemoreceptors that are found in your nose. Um, they synapse in the, with the olfactory bulb 
Um, and so it integrates into the central nervous system, the, the amygdala and the hippocampus. So again, these are specialized receptor cells. They're gonna have specialized receptors that can pick up on different types of chemicals. Obviously smell is so important with your sensation of taste. Taste, you might only have a handful of chemicals like salt and sweets and so forth that you pick up. But when you eat food, the sensation is so much greater because of your sense of smell. And in fact, when you're sick and can't smell very well, your senses of food dramatically decrease. <clears throat> so that you may have tons of different types of receptors for different chemicals. So you can to pick up on all the sorts of different types of chemicals that are found in the environment. So again, taste receptors might be four or five, depending on how you define them, while smell can have a large range. And, you know, we have, we, we have okay smell, we have the okay ability to smell, but there's lots of animals that have the ability to smell that make us look kind of blind and deaf to smelling. You know, a bloodhound can follow a blood trail or a footprints of a, you know, a suspect running from a crime scene, for instance. It's incredible the amount of smells that we are blind to. So we're certainly not superior to some animals when it comes to a sense of smell. So anyway, the, the olfactory receptors are found in the roof of the nasal cavity. Um, chemicals are dissolved in the mucus and hook up with the nerves directly. And then this is this, these smells are interpreted in the cortex. Okay, so here is our nose. And you can see up at the very, very top is the olfactory bulb and olfactory trap track. And underneath it are our olfactory receptor cells that are constantly growing. So these can be stem cells that are constantly dying and growing in. And you have this mucus layer, and when you pick up air from the environment, the chemicals dissolve into the air, or into the mucus, excuse me, and then hook up with special receptors like lock and keys that will then trigger, um, they'll then trigger um, action potentials that will synapse with the olfactory bulb and then go to the olfactory cortex will be interpreted. Again, these are hair cells. These are constantly being replaced um, and then there's support cells around it as well. Now something like a dog will have thousands of more of these olfactory receptor cells than ourselves. Uh, but again, they are stem cells that are regularly replaced. And it makes sense a lot why you would want to do that because they are directly interacting with the environment. And when directly interacting with the environment, um, they get damaged regularly. And so they're constantly replaced. And so here you can see stem cells being replaced and the new ones being formed. Here's another picture showing you that the sensory cells, chemoreceptory cells are leaving through the bony areas and, and attaching with the mucus, the pickup fluids. And here's olfactory glands releasing mucus and so forth. It's microcilia. Here is some more looks of that where we have the olfactory epithelium attaching to the olfactory bulb. And that's our secondary neurons that are traveling down to the, through the olfactory tra tract, through the olfactory, you know, from the olfactory bulb down the olfactory tract to be interpreted by the brain. Here's some more developing olfactory cells. And again, these are just chemical receptor cells that come and go. And whatever you're smelling in the air hooks up with the receptors and then you'll have some type of little action potential or not. 
but that'll release, um, you know, synapse and cause action potentials down these secondary neurons, just like we talked before. So anyway, I think that's good finishing up the first set of lectures. We will probably get into taste and hearing and maybe even vision or I might say vision for the last one. So we'll have taste and hearing probably for the next one. And um, so what I'd like you to do is just summarize again, a little bit over a half a page, single space, what you learned from this lecture. And <clears throat> maybe talk a little bit about lateral inhibition or referred pain or something like that, uh, or the gate control theory of pain, try to think about those kind of things and discuss them in a little bit more detail. If you decide to add a diagram, I think that would be great. But I think that's enough for this particular lecture. And again, we'll start on taste in a moment. <laughs>